Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode of my Sunderland 11. Uh, as always we are in association with the Sunderland Food Bank doing credible work around the city of Sunderland so please do check them out and donate. We're also in association with a charity up here uh, the Sunderland Fans Museum who've also done incredible work during lockdown delivering uh, meals to the elderly who can't leave their houses and um, they've just done an incredible jobs so do go check them out in the description and support. With me I have one of Britain's best-selling authors uh, most well known for writing the horrible uh, history series, <laughs> Terry Deary. Thank you very much for joining me. How are Good you? Good morning, Matthew. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, no problem whatsoever. No problem. Really looking forward to this one. So, really, how's your sort of third lockdown? How's your uh, lockdown been? Oh, great. Um, I'm a writer, so I've self-isolated for the last forty odd years writing books. Um, and as it happened, just before lockdown hit last year, I had commissions for 10 books, a movie, um, and three stage plays. So last year I was fully occupied. This year I've kicked off with two or three commissions. So um, I feel almost guilty saying lockdown is not a problem for me. I've even, on January the 3rd this year, passed my 75th birthday. So of course I got injected. You know? yeah. So uh, I'm safe. Um, I'd better be careful speaking to you in case you infect me. But, uh, you know, at least, you know, I won't infect you. <laughs> no, no, no. That's, that's, that's good to hear. So have you been working on any sort of new projects then during these during these lockdowns anyone could look forward to in the future? Yeah, but the biggie is probably the movie um, because um, I was invited to write um, a documentary feature film to commemorate the 40th anniversary of the running of the Great North Run last September. And of course, it never happened. Um, so it's been delayed a year, but it gives me another another year to write it. The downside, it sounds good, but the downside is it's all under the umbrella of somebody called Brendan Foster, who happens to be a Newcastle United supporter. Mm. And every time I meet him, he never lets me forget it. You know, so um, it's uh, that's the, the downside. Every uh, silver lining has a cloud, I suppose. Exactly. Um, I've, got, <laughs> I've got an Irish series of books coming out. Um, more Horrible Histories on the way. And Horrible Histories is being relaunched this year with a new look. They freshen it up after 27 years. It's been going on. And um, so they're doing a lot of publicity, a lot of Zoomy type calls and interviews and uh, this sort of thing. So uh, a busy year ahead. Yeah, excellent. That's, that's really good to hear, though. So there's a lot of stuff to look forward to. Um, so I'll just take you sort of uh, right back to uh, we'll talk about the talk about the football team. How did you first start supporting Sunderland? <laughs> My dad was a, a Sunderland supporter. Uh, we lived in, in Seaburn. We had a shop in Hendon, but we lived in Seaburn. And we could hear Roker Park from our house in Dyklands Road, near the sea. And if Sunderland scored, you could hear the roar. And you could see the people going home from the game. And you could tell by their faces. You didn't have to ask the score. You could just see from the faces what the result was. And because my dad... Uh, was a butcher and he had to work every Saturday. We never got to games. But then in 1955, November, I think it was the 10th of November, you can find this on YouTube, Sunderland installed at Roker Park floodlights. And so they had a special game against a Moscow team to launch the floodlights. And because it was a Wednesday evening, um, my dad was able to take me along. And that was my first game at the age of nine. And now I'm 75, that's uh, doing um, 66 years uh, come November. So 65 years now I've been a supporter through thick and thin, more thin than thick, I think. <laughs> yeah, excellent. What would you say your best memory is as a Sunderland fan over the years? Um, well, like every Sunderland fan who's lived long enough, the cup final... Um, which was a weird sort of experience. I was a professional actor. I was living in a little town in Wales called Brecon, and there was no way could I get from Brecon to Wembley and back in, in the day. So I had to watch it on a black and white television. 
And everybody said to me, so where are you from? I said, Sunderland. And they said, where's that? And then the, the match went on television. And on my right-hand side, I'm not boasting here, right? There was an, uh, a dark-haired actress. And on my left-hand side was a red-haired actress, both very, um, very attractive. And they knew very little about football because it was Wales and rugby. Mm. And Sunderland scored. And I jumped up and punched the air. Yes! And the actress on my right said, was that good? Oh, <laughs> but then, you see, I went out for a, a pint of Welsh beer. Don't get me started on Welsh bitter. Um, and walking up the hill towards the pub, two little Welsh boys came down the hill and they were chanting, Sunderland, Sunderland, Sunderland. And suddenly I <laughs> felt, you know, we've made our mark on this little Welsh island in the middle of all the hills because we'd won the cup. Nobody supported Leeds if you were a neutral, obviously. Um, and so that was my overwhelming memory, as well as some of the, the, the great games. Um, and the other memory is being relegated to Division 3 for the first time. And uh, there were people around me crying when uh, Gillingham scored the equaliser, which pretty well sent us down, you know. Um, yeah. But the, the good and the bad, you know. Yes, uh, of course. Uh, that's usually what it is with Sunderland. It's a lot more bad than good, but, uh, you know, it makes you appreciate the good times even more. It does. Um, yes, absolutely. So what I want to know is, really, is did um, the football ever inspire any stories that you wrote? Uh, not Sunderland Football Club. My own personal football, because I'm... Um, my dad used to take me in the back garden, which was only about 15 yards long. And he used to have me uh, kicking the ball, left foot, right foot, learning to head it. And uh, I started playing for my school, Fullwood Junior School, um, as a sort of midfield, you'd call it now. I would call it right half in those days. And then I played for the Cubs. And I was a star striker for the Cubs. And it was... In a way, it was sad because we beat everybody in sight. I played for All Saints along Fulwell Road and we had black strips with yellow sleeves, which was quite unusual. And I scored an absolute bucket load of goals. There's one game, we scored seven before half time, and I'd scored six of them. So the referee blew and we turned round Start of the second half, I ran up the pitch and scored another one, 8 nil, and I'd scored 7. The referee blew full time after about two minutes. And it took me years to realise, first of all, the referee was being kind to the opposition. And secondly, we weren't brilliant. I wasn't brilliant. Just we were playing against little kids, you know, who couldn't knock a milk bottle over. And I think it would have been kinder still if that referee had turned to my team and said, look, you know, you're going to win this game. Let them score one or two goals. Just stand still for a while. And um, that led me to write a book called The Hat Trick for a company in Scotland called Barrington Stoke, which was very much based on uh, my, the game where I scored my first hat trick. Um, and still, after uh, 65 years, remember those three goals. And my hero in the book, The Hat Trick, uh, scored those um, the same goals that I did. So it's yeah. uh, quite unusual, really. Uh, yeah, but a that, great memory to have. Absolutely. That's great to hear. Um, just got one last question for you before we go through uh, your Sunderland 11. And that's a question I ask all the guests. And if you could put it into your own words... Uh, what does Sunderland AFC mean to you? It means the difference between having a good weekend and a bad weekend. If Sunderland mm. win, or even in an evening, if they win tonight, you know, um, I'll be, you know, really up for it tomorrow. If they lose, I'll be really down. It's, uh, I'm sorry, it's not a, an unusual story that winning and losing changes your mood. It's, it's very strange. 
Um, but that's what it does for me. It uh, decides my mood for the next few days. Yeah, exactly, exactly. That. That's the that's the same with me as well, and a, a lot of supporters really. And uh, it's just it, it's just weird what a, what a football club can do to you. Um, all right, then. So that's good to hear. So we'll just we'll go through your start eleven now. Now I believe you've gone with a four four two formation. Yes, four four two will yeah. do nicely. Although oh, yeah. I could do with ten ten ten, but never mind. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. So okay, we'll start off with the person you've got in goal. Who have you got in goal? Uh, I'll come to him in a minute. Let me just tell you, goalkeepers are so important. Um, the, the position we're in now, which is not great, is because of goalkeepers. Uh, a lot of supporters will tell you, if we'd had better goalkeepers in the championship, we might not have been in League One. Yeah. But there's one goalkeeper above all who dumped us where we are, and his name is Joe Hart. Did you know that? Yeah. <laughs> Joe Hart was playing for England against Iceland. He let in a stupid goal that my granny could have saved, and she's been dead for 50 years. And so England didn't progress. Roy Hodgson got the sack, and they gave the job to Sam Allardyce. We lost Sam Allardyce, all because of Joe Hart's mistake. If we still had Sam Allardyce, I don't think we'd be where we are today. Yeah. So goalkeeper's not my... I used to play in goal. And uh, they say goalkeepers need to be a bit mad. And on the days I felt mad, I was brilliant. I, I played one game where I kept just about everything out and we won. And I felt so good. The next week, I let in five. You know, this is a goalkeeper's job. And the worst part was we were playing opposite uh, Sunderland Greyhound Stadium. And um, I queued up for the bus after the match outside the Greyhound Stadium. And two of their players were waiting for the same bus. And they didn't see me there, but one turned to the other and said, mind, their goalkeeper wasn't very good, was he? Oh, thanks, Brick. Uh, so yeah. it's a hard life being a goalkeeper. It the is, good yeah. goalkeepers, um, Mark Poom, Thomas Sorensen, are all pretty much alike. So what I've gone for is a crazy goalkeeper because I think we go to a football match to be entertained. And one of the crazy goalkeepers was Lionel Perez, who, um, unlike any other goalkeeper, I seem to remember with his sleeves rolled up and going for mad balls that maybe he would have been better staying on his line. He was unpredictable. And there's nothing wrong with being unpredictable. He was a good shot stopper, um, but he had his occasional mad moments. And I'm all in favour of mad goalkeepers. So he'd be my number one. Fantastic! You know that you make all the uh, you have right reasons there. I mean, I, I used to be a goalkeeper myself, and it just shows that yeah. uh, you know you, you let you let in like two or three goals, and you, your confidence just goes really. And uh, yeah, yeah. It, it, it is an interesting position to play. But no, that's that's a good choice. I do agree. Um, all right, then. So we'll start. We'll go back to your back four. Uh, we'll start with the fullback. So we'll start with the person you got a right back. There's a character called Cecil Irwin or Cess Irwin. And this was in the days, and I'm sure somebody will correct me, before I'd heard the term overlapping fullback. Before those, uh, before Cecil Owen, I always imagined a fullback just stood there and stopped the wingers from uh, cutting in or scoring. Uh, but Cecil Owen used to charge up the pitch. He was an unlikely looking footballer. He had a Bobby Charlton comb over hairstyle over his bald head. Um, and he was looked a bit ungainly, but once he started running up the wing and overlapping, he had a huge stride and it just lifted the crowd. And you know the way that when a, a, a fullback overlaps and runs, the crowd sort of gets a buzz. And he was, wasn't bad at his um, final uh, ball delivery either. So he's largely forgotten, except for people in my generation maybe, but for me, Cesar will, uh, Ces Irwin even, overlapping fullback, uh, a hero of mine. And I can still see him running up the wing at Roker Park. Fantastic. Fantastic to hear. So we'll switch now to your uh, left back. So who have you got left back? There's somebody called Lem Ashurst. Now, in those days, footballers were real people. And Lem Ashurst 
lived just across the road from me in Dighton's Road. None of these gated, walled mansions, but an ordinary semi-detached house in Seaburn in Sunderland. And he was one of these players who didn't show great emotion. In those days, footballers didn't hug and kiss each other. They may be the odd handshake if um, you did something good or scored a goal. <laughs> and Len Ashurst always looked very doer. And for me, a lot of the players I've picked, there are moments in time. And one of them was at Roker Park, where we were playing against a little team called Leeds. I hope you're not related, Mr. Leeds, to Leeds. No. <laughs> but uh, they, they were not our favourite team. And they were considered under Don Revy to be a little bit, what's the polite word I'm looking for? Um, hard to play against. Hmm. And one of the um, hardest players was somebody called Bobby Collins. And Bobby Collins came down towards Len Ashurst. Len Ashurst had the ball. And Bobby Collins went in what's politely called a two-footed tackle um, at roughly the height of Len Ashurst's knees. There was a bit of a tangle and Len Ashurst got up and walked away. And Bobby Collins was carried off with a broken leg, which was a sort of poetic justice, if you like. And mm. so I'll never forget that. Um, I, I've got one or two hard men in my team and I make no apologies for that. That I think mm. you need one or two hard men. I think Sunderland could probably do with a, a Kevin Ball or somebody like that now yeah. just to um, remind the opposition that this is not a stroll in the park where you can pass the ball around and walk past um, defenders. So yeah, uh, a hard man and that is the moment that sticks in my head from Roker Park, Len Ashurst. Fantastic. Yeah, I think he's one of Sunderland's like record appearance makers under Jimmy Montgomery. He he's he was, you know, he's pretty much just Mr. Sunderland really. So that's a, a fantastic yeah. choice you have there. Uh, so we'll move now to your central defenders. Do you want to do you want to talk us through who you've gone with? Well I talk first of all um Dave Watson. We talk about um a hard man and Dave Watson was really um must have been awesome to come up against. I know people say that the player of the century was Charlie Hurley, but I have a feeling Charlie Hurley um, in the later eras of the century would have been a bit slow on the turn and he wasn't great at going forward. Whereas Dave Watson with the long, dark hair must have been pretty awesome and he could pass and he could run forward and he took no prisoners. Of course, he was part of the, the cup winning team and... Um, it's it's ever so sad that he's now suffering from this heading problem because uh, that's what he was so good at, apart from tackling. And I think we've got to remember that some of our heroes have paid the price for being our heroes. And uh, it would be good if we could somehow support the new campaign that's coming for dementia in footballers. But when he was in his prime, Dave Watson was... Uh, a magnificent sight, um, not just in the cup final, but week after week. And that's what we need. Somebody solid in the middle of defence. Absolutely. Completely agree with that. So we'll move now to his central defensive partner. Who have you got there? Gary Bennett. Gary Bennett. What a lovely bloke, you know. <laughs> he was as hard as Dave Watson, I'm sure. But he was, a, he, I've met him once. He's a, a nice bloke. And um, he's passionate about Sunderland. And you get so many players these days who come and go, don't make a lot of ripples, but there aren't many around who actually feel, you know, we're part of a, a team with great traditions. Uh, I think Gary Bennett came from the Midlands. He adopted Sunderland and he's still a great supporter. He's very red and white eyed. He can't see many faults that the rest of us can. Um, but that's not a fault. There's nothing wrong with being a passionate Sunderland supporter. But for a player to be a Sunderland supporter, um, I think is unusual these days. There are a lot of players out there in today's team, tomorrow's team, 
who, if you offered them enough money, would say, pack their bags and say, oh, yes, thank you, Sunderland. I enjoyed playing for you. Right, let's get on with my new team. They, they don't have the attachment to Sunderland that you used to have in the old days. And that, for me, um, is what Gary Bennett represents. And I still remember from him, we're talking about moments, is playing Jim, Gillingham when we were relegated to Division Three, and the ball came in, he stretched for it to hit the top of his head, went in the goal and gave away an own goal. And um, it, it broke a few hearts that day, but it wasn't his fault, you know. But great, great bloke. And above all, his dedication to Sunderland is why I've picked him. Yep, absolutely. I couldn't have said it much better myself. That's fantastic. So that is a very solid back four, I have to say. It's very solid. I don't think anything's going, going to go past them. So we'll move to your midfield now. So we'll start off, we'll start off your left winger first. Left winger. <laughs> there are some players on the pitch who, when the ball comes to them, your heart rate goes up just a bit because you think they're going to do something. Very often... They uh, give the ball away, run out of touch, fall over. But sometimes they do magn something magnificent. And the nearest we've got today is Aidan McGeady. People see mm. the ball, go to McGeady. Yes, something's going to happen. And it doesn't always. And for me, that player was Andy Reid. And like McGeady, he could disappear for half an hour. And then the ball would come to him and he'd do something wonderful or something stupid. Um, but it's the excitement level. And that's why we go to football matches. We don't go um, just to win. A, a lot of people do. It's Bob Sh Bill Shankly even. He said, if you don't support us when we lose or draw, don't support us when we win. And uh, it's pretty much the same. We've got to remember that when we support Sunderland. We support them win, lose or draw. And we can be critical, we all are. Um, but what we mostly want when we go to the stadium is to be excited, to see some moments that will stick in our memory. And Andy Reid, you know, getting the ball, on a, it was attached to his boot on a, 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 a bit of string. You know, one of those players. <laughs> a great player, unpredictable, but... That's what I want to see in the team, a player who excites you as soon as they get the ball. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's, what, that's what you do want now. Um, especially, you know, a lot of people, um, they just sort of say, uh, you know, the win's just the most important thing. But at the same time, you do want to go to a match and, and be entertained as well. That's what it's all about, absolutely. Yeah. So we'll switch over to your other winger, your right winger. Would you like, us, would you like to talk us through that? That would be Billy Hughes. When I used to watch football on the television, the player I admired most non-Sunderland was Francis Lee of Manchester City because he would run at people. And you don't see this very often these days. Uh, maybe Jack Diamond is uh, a player. But Sunderland don't have somebody who terrifies the opposition. They get the ball and suddenly they are backing off because they know he's going to run. And that's what Billy Hughes did. And there was one game which stands out in my memory. Uh, Roker Park, 1971-ish, I think, against Bolton. Half-time, 3-1 down. And Billy Hughes came on on the right wing. And if he didn't assist with the three goals we scored in the second half to win 4-3, then he scored them. And this was... Um, the, the excitement level I'm talking about. Give the ball to Billy Hughes, go for the jugular, cross the ball or put it in the net. And, uh, of course, part of the, the cup final team again. I'm not obsessed with the cup final, uh, but um, it's maybe that era that um, I'm most familiar with. Mm. Even though I wasn't in Sunderland at the time, from 1972 to 1980, I was away working. So I didn't see much of the 70s. But before I left, Billy Hughes on the wing. What a, an inspiring player to watch. 
Absolutely. Uh, two great wingers you've got there then. Um, so we'll head now to your central midfield. So who would you like Would you like to talk us through who you have in the central midfield? I've gone for a creative player and a nutcase. Or well, actually, we're both creative and nutcases. <laughs> Let's start with Jim Baxter. He came from Scotland with a terrific reputation as a quality player. And boy, was he. He could control the game. They talk now um, about certain players in midfield who stand on the ball, look around, and they're, they're playmakers. Uh, Italy had Pirolo and Zidane and in, in France and so on. But for Sunderland, the greatest playmaker for me was Jim Baxter. And I was in the Roker end when he made his debut and we won 4-2, he scored two. And he um, he was one of these who I think would be very, very hard to manage. He was a very strong character. And um, while he was at Sunderland, he created the, the excitement and the creativity that we lacked and that we need probably today. I know he probably wouldn't go down in League One where we are now, but um, that's that's what you want. Somebody who can dictate the play and run the team just because of their skills. Passes that are accurate. Passes that have vision. And I saw that from Aidan McGeady uh, last Saturday when he put the ball through for Charlie White. That was a visionary pass. And I know Charlie White finished it really well. Credit to him. But it was the pass that I didn't see coming. Um, but Aidan McGeady, down there, surrounded by players, saw the pass and made it. Jim Baxter could do that a dozen times a game. And so a great loss to that we haven't got somebody quite like that now, but very, very entertaining to watch. Fantastic, fantastic. So his midfield partner. Is he the nutcase or the creative one? This He's is the nutcase, nutcase one. He's a nutcase. He's a nutcase. Yeah. <laughs> Len Shackleton. Um, um, that must be a, an alien uh, to anybody under 70. But he played in that first game that I saw against the Moscow team. The floodlights were like nothing I'd ever seen. The grass looked greener than any gr grass I'd seen. And they had this theory in those days that if you're playing under floodlights, you won't see the players. So the players had to wear shiny shirts. It was a, a weird idea. And Shackleton decided, this is a friendly. I can entertain the crowd and I can entertain myself. And he could do wonderful things with the ball. And one of the things he could do was wait a pass. And they say there was a centre forward that he didn't like. Um, and he would sometimes wait it. So it was just too hard for the centre forward to reach. And he was deliberately um, teasing the centre forward. And they, um, they didn't get on. And on that game, Sunderland got free kicks. And what Shackleton did was he took a bit of the sandy soil and built it up into a little tee for the ball. So he could get his boot under it and curve it. And the referee saw this came across and stamped on the pyramid. And so Shackleton was going to be obliged to, um, to take a normal free kick. As soon as the referee turned his back and walked away, Shackleton built the pyramid up again and took the free kick anyway. And that was, uh, it was funny. It was a laugh. And how many laughs, how many funny players, do you, how many times do you go to a match and say, that was funny? Well, it was a bit of uh, character showing through. And, of course, Shackleton um, had a couple of good quotes. When he was asked, who do you support? He said, I support two teams, Sunderland and whoever's playing Newcastle. And, um, of course, that was a great quote. Um, yeah. And the other quote was in his autobiography, everything that directors of a football club know about football blank page which yeah. um, reminds me of Tom Cowie. Tom Cowie used to own Sunderland 
And I met him one night at a, a dinner in Sunderland. And he started talking about his time as owner of Sunderland. And he said um, his biggest mistake, biggest regret, was hiring Laurie McMenemy as manager. He said, Laurie McMenemy, you could write a book that thick about what he didn't know about football. If Mr. McMenemy is watching this, I didn't say that. Tom Cowie did. And he's dead now, so you can't sue him. Right. But um, I think yeah. that would have um, chimed with a lot of uh, Sunderland supporters from that time. And so, yeah, Len Shackleton, what do directors know about football? Blank page. And he got into a lot of trouble for that. And he didn't care. Good for him. Thank you, Len. <laughs> well, he's probably telling the truth, to be honest with you. A lot of people who are in charge of football clubs now, uh, you know, you can think to, uh, you know, a, a lot of people, but... Um, but yeah, no, that's Shackleton. That's a, a fantastic choice. Um, so yeah, that is your um, defence and midfield done. Um, you have got two strikers up front who you're going to rely on to score the goals. So, would you like to talk us through who you've gone with up front? Um, Brian Clough. Who else? You know, he, yeah. he was um, a great finisher, but he's also another one of these great characters. If you see Brian Clough, will be centre forward today, you'd go, you'd pay good money to go in the ground. And that's what um, clubs are lacking these days, the characters who you want to go and see. You know who they are in the Premiership, but I'm not sure there's anybody, maybe McGeady, I don't know, that Pete would say, wow, he's playing today, we must go and watch that game because something will happen. Brian Clough, big mouth, um, again, famous quotes when he became a manager. I wouldn't say I'm the best manager in the world, but I'm in the top one. You know, th this sort of thing. That, um, that's what football needs. It needs character. It needs people who stand out from the crowd, apart from being a skillful player. Such a shame he, he got injured in his career, ended early. And such a shame he never became our manager. I think... Um, I think he could have done things for the club. He might not have won everything in sight, but we'd have had fun. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's a shame we didn't. But he he is a he is a, a very good legend. Uh, one we'll, one a lot of supporters will rem remember well. So his striking partner to lead the line. Who have you got? A man who a great football, a great Sunderland player. But the reason I picked him is for one second of the whole of my football career. It's Jermaine Defoe. And the, the one second was the home game against Newcastle United. Nil-nil with a couple of minutes to go to half time. The ball came to him on the edge of the football penalty area, Newcastle penalty area. And next moment, it was in the back of the net. How did he do that? It was mm. an incredible strike. I think uh, their goalkeeper was um, Krull, wasn't it? Yes. And uh, he got into trouble at the end of the half, going in and rubbing Defoe's head as if to say, you jummy so-and-so. Yeah. And uh, it, could, it could have been right. You know, I don't care, you know. Uh, Jermaine Defoe, for that one moment that... I, I talk about Sunderland making me happy for the weekend. That made me happy for a year. You know, I could watch that strike over and over again. But apart from that, he was a great servant to the club. He loved the club, the same as Gary Bennett, I think. And um, he had tremendous skill. So for me, uh, Jermaine Defoe, up there with Brian Clough, I don't know how they, they've got on. There's a striking partnership. Probably hated each other. Never mind, this is a fantasy team. Um, so thank you, Jermaine, for everything you did for us. Absolutely. And you know that goal he scored against Newcastle, the volley? I think he said in an interview he only hit that because he was so tired. He said if he had a bit more <laughs> energy, he would, have, he would have taken it down. But because he was so tired, he just thought, no, I'd hit it straight away on the volley. And it, with his weak I foot. I have seen that. 
yeah, it, it flew into the top corner. So the only reason why I hit that is because he was exhausted from running around. But yeah, it, on, on and off the pitch, a lot of people have chosen him. What he did for the Bradley Lowry Foundation as well. Um, you know, he's got an, o, an OBE now. He's got his own sort of foundation. Um, so yeah, he just, he just, he's a really, he's a really great guy. I've met, met him a few times as well. Obviously, living down here in uh, Essex, there's a lot of Tottenham fans, and they remember Jermaine Defoe very well as well. So yeah, it was it was it was great for us to have a, a wonderful player like Jermaine Defoe as well. So yeah, that's that's a fantastic choice. So yeah, there's your team going along the bottom. Um, yeah, Terry. I mean, thank you very much for giving up your time and listening to your stories. It's been absolutely fascinating, really, to listen to it. you like talk about each one of the players. So thank you very much for that. Don't you want my manager? I'd love, I'd, I'd love your manager. Yes, please. <laughs> I, I could have said uh, anybody but Howard Wilkinson, um, but um, Roy Keane for his shoes, standing on the touchline with those brilliant shoes, and for his um, passion, and um, of course Peter Reid for his passion. But the manager has to be Sam Allardyce. Uh, nobody quite inspired an average team the way he did. Um, hmm. Such a shame. Um, let's blame Joe Hart that we haven't yeah. got Sam Allardyce now. I'd have him back. I'd pay his bus fare to come up here to manage us again. You know? yeah. So Sam Allardyce, um, a, a great loss. And one of the reasons maybe why we're not in the best of positions today. Come back, Sam. All is forgiven. Of course, yeah. Uh, I mean, I, his problem is being, being in League One. It, there's something he'd never take on, and it's just such a shame, really. And uh, yeah, it, it's 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 amazing, really, what what one manager can do. You know, he he took a team yeah. of, of players that he just got the best out of them. You know, you had someone like Jan Kirkhoff who just got injured every week under Moyes, but Sam Allardyce just knew how to manage him, and he and he was just such a, a really clever guy. And uh, yeah, it's. it's such a shame to lose him and I think that's part part of the reason why we are where we are now which is which is unfortunate but of course we'll, we'll, we'll always welcome him back yeah. so well, that is your you that's like that's okay no problem thank you very much for coming on so yeah that, that that's your team it's a fantastic team one I'm sure would entertain uh the whole city of Sunderland uh at Roker Park that, that'd be fantastic um just before we leave it there have you got a message for the Sunderland fans uh who are watching yeah, um, life is a circle, a wheel, and at the low, we're at the bottom of the wheel, but you know that wheels turn and we'll be back at the top one day. All you've got to do is hang on, keep keep the faith, as they say, and we'll be back. We'll be back. We'll be back. Yeah, keep the faith. Um, but yes, thank you very much for joining me. As always, the video is in association with the Sunderland Food Bank and the Sunderland Fans Museum as well. So please do go and check out uh, th those uh, charities and try and help out as best you can. But yeah, thank you all very much for watching and we'll see you all in the next episode. How are you, the lads?